Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, January 9th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here are tonight's top stories. Tonight, exclusive, an RPG was fired inside the Charlie Hebdo office. Then, is a new cyber attack imminent? And filmmaker Kevin Booth talks media censorship. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, I've got to say, I'm really ashamed of Western media in the U.S. and in Europe. Three terrorists and four hostages are dead today after the French police stormed two hostage situations in France earlier today. Now, this includes the two brothers who were suspected of massacring 12 people at the Paris newspaper Charlie Hebdo on Wednesday. Uh, they were killed while the single hostage that they were holding survived the ordeal unharmed, and the police staged a separate assault on a kosher supermarket in Paris where a second hostage situation was taking place. That hostage taker uh, was believed to be an associate of the two brothers. He was killed. Four hostages there were killed. Several others were injured, while five were able to be released unharmed. Now, it's believed that the gunman at the supermarket is connected to the earlier killing of a policewoman that happened yesterday. But before the suspects were killed, they spoke out uh, via the telephone with a French television station. And here's what they said. Est-ce que vous êtes en lien avec, avec les deux frères qui ont, qui ont fait l'opération à Charlie Hebdo Oui, on s'est synchro synchronisé pour faire les opérations. Vous êtes synchronisé de quelle manière C'est-à-dire qu'il y a encore d'autres événements qui sont prévus Vous avez un scénario ensemble que vous déroulez Non, on s'est juste synchronisé pour le départ. Ça veut dire quand ils ont commencé Charlie Hebdo, et moi j'ai commencé à faire euh, les policiers. Not exactly clear at this time if that shooter meant that he was the one who took care of the policeman that we saw on camera. Uh, perhaps that's why the other suspect that was named turned himself in earlier uh, this week. But al-Qaeda in Yemen is now coming out and saying that they claim to have directed this attack, um, tweeted out actually that it was revenge for uh, the honor of Muhammad. And also, it was interesting that one of the suspects there, Saeed, was specific to point out that he had met with Anwar Alawalaki, and Reuters is also reporting that he did indeed meet with Anwar Alawalaki, the U.S.-born and web-savvy, influential international recruiter to the al-Qaeda movement. So, of course, this story is just getting curiouser by the minute. It's not just the fact that these seemingly well-trained jihadists who were so calm that they were able to go back and pick up a shoe. Meanwhile, one of them left their ID in the getaway car. Very, very suspect. But now it's turned out that they have also been in contact with someone who spent a little time having dinner at the Pentagon. Here is our writer, Mikhail Thalen, with more. This is Mikhail Thalen with Infowars.com here with some breaking news. If you look at Reuters right now, they have an exclusive report from an intelligence source in Yemen. Turns out one of the brothers involved in the Charlie Hebdo shooting had actually in 2011 met with uh, Anwar Alawaki. And of course, as many of you know, Anwar Alawaki met with high ranking military officials at the Pentagon only months after 9 11. And uh, of course, later in 2002, it was later learned that the FBI actually had him in custody due to his ties to Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And it turns out that he was in custody and let go. So now if we fast forward again, we have Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer on the show in 2012. He exposed the fact that he was clearly working for the FBI. He was a triple agent also involved with the CIA. And so what makes it even more obvious is the fact that if you remember the uh, Christmas Day bombing in 2009 or the attempted bombing by Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, the so-called underwear bomber, that turned out to clearly be a government-run operation. And we know that... Um, Anwar Alawaki was running this guy. Kirk Haskell famously came on our show. He was on the flight. He saw what was going on. And later, the State Department, under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy, came on and said, yes, we tried to flag the underwear bomber. We didn't want him on the flight. But a, quote, unknown government agency demanded that he get on the flight. So clearly, the government was running this. So what this shows is that clearly he was meeting with someone with high connections to the United States government. Now, I've talked to Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, and he believes that um, – 
in Rallawaki ended up triple crossing the federal government, and that's why they took him out with a drone strike, as many of you know, in 2011 as well. So does this mean that the shooters are connected to an intelligence agency? Does this mean that there's government involved with this? We don't know, but this is definitely a major point that needs to be shown that clearly he had ties to someone who had ties to the FBI, the CIA, and really the whole intelligence uh, officials. So if you want to keep following us for more breaking news on this, head to Infowars.com. So now, of course, almost immediately it's coming out that the government's knew about these suspects beforehand for quite some time, yet these attacks were still able to take place. The massive NSA surveillance wasn't able to stop these attacks. Of course, it's the same old story, and instantly we're seeing calls for over-militarization, saying that situations like this call for an over-militarization of the police, more NSA surveillance, when indeed it didn't actually stop these attacks from happening. Uh, but it's just that's what it is. Use these crises to call for more tyranny. And that's what we're seeing, trying to keep everyone in this state of constant fear over these terrorists while they're not actually doing anything to stop it. Now, this is coming out of the British Security Service, of course, taking advantage of this hysteria. Uh, this is the director general of MI5, uh, Andrew Parker. He's warning that Coruscant will soon strike. This Coruscant, this elusive group that just sort of popped up out of nowhere, uh, he says the MI5 boss told members of the Royal United Services Institute that a group of core al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria is planning mass casualty attacks against the West. So the likely targets will be transit systems or iconic targets to inflict large-scale loss of life. So this is the aim, keeping people scared of terrorist groups everywhere. Could they stop these potential jihadis beforehand? Absolutely one of the ways they could do that is by not arming the rebels there because like we've reported before, these arms are just getting into the wrong hands. And here we have these suspects who spent some time in Yemen are apparently able to get their hands on some RPGs. Now, this is a high level military source in France who's associated with the French National Police confirmed exclusively to Infowars that at least one rocket propelled grenade was detonated inside the the Charlie Edbo building. Uh, the French National Police kept quiet about the RPG to keep from scaring the public. And it also, of course, explains why they released very few images from inside the office. So the suspects were known to the government officials for years, able to travel from Yemen, get their hands on some RB RPGs, um, but of course are never caught and are allowed to carry out these attacks. We've seen this so many times before, time and time again. And when these suspects were first identified, uh, there were conflicting reports of if they had been to Yemen, had they not. And then, of course, now it comes out that they did. And now they have ties to the Pentagon. What else did we know about these suspects? I'm Joe Biggs with Infowars.com with an update on the Charlie Hebdo attacks. The Charlie Hebdo massacre suspects were on the U.S. no-fly list for years and that they trained with al-Qaeda in Yemen. It says the two suspects behind the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris have been on a U.S. no-fly list for years, a U.S. official said. According to different revelations, one of the suspects trained with al-Qaeda linked militants in Yemen, Sharif and Saeed. French-born sons of Algerian parents were both logged in the U.S. government's Terrorist Identities Data Mart Environment System, which is called TIDE, a database on known or suspected international terrorists. U.S. counterterrorism sources said on condition of anonymity. So stay tuned for more reports. I'll keep you updated throughout the day. I'm Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. Now, the hacktivist group Anonymous has come out to say that they will avenge Charlie Hebdo attacks by shutting down any jihadist websites or anyone affiliated with them on social media. The group released a video and a statement via Twitter with a message for al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, and other terrorists, and it was also uploaded to the group's Belgian account. The group says that they're going to track down and close all accounts on social networks that are related to terrorists in order to avenge those who have been killed. A backed up statement on Pastebin said, freedom of expression has suffered inhuman assault and it is our duty to react. Now there's also an opcharliehedbo.com that uh, we found earlier today and it's actually a countdown clock on, on, on this website. So it's giving like a day, sort of a countdown, uh, but the official 
op Charlie Hedbo is saying that that's not, they're not responsible for that. They're saying it's a fake, it might be a scam, avoid it. So if you click there, you'll see it's kind of this countdown clock. They're saying they're not responsible for that. Now, officials have also come out saying that they're, you know, they're warning about a cyber Pearl Harbor. So here, if this op Charlie Hedbo is saying that they're not responsible for creating this, are we going to see a Pearl Harbor and then maybe blame it on Anonymous? We'll just have to wait and see. But now this is coming from the chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security, Michael McCall, and he's here using this Sony attack to call, of course, for stricter cybersecurity legislation. Um, he's, you know, this is, of course, despite the fact that cybersecurity experts refute the claim that North Korea had anything to do with it. They still say it was more likely an inside job. But of course, our government is going to just continue to say that we need tighter restrictions on the internet. Now, McCall says that the real significance here lies in the fact that, according to the FBI, this marks the first major destructive cyber attack waged against a U.S. company, and there are little to no consequences for conducting cyber attacks. So criminals and nation states are becoming bolder in their threats and their behavior. So of course, what would be the answer here? More laws, more legislation, not, not doing anything to actually protect our critical infrastructure. Now Snowden kind of alluded to this as well. Uh, he was being interviewed for an upcoming, I believe a PBS documentary. And he said that the United States efforts to dominate cyberspace Maybe, maybe misguided and are ultimately damaging to the country's national security. They're playing the wrong role, basically. The NSA is actually standing for the National Surveillance Agency rather than the National Security Agency. Uh, he's basically calling for the NSA to defend us from internet-based attacks rather than going out and targeting foreign countries and exploiting uh, vulnerabilities, because this is... This is if the foreign countries that we are attacking take this similar cyber posture and start trying to attack America's critical infrastructure. We have a lot more to lose because we are so dependent on the Internet. Our tech industry is basically the backbone of America. And Snowden actually spells it out here, and he says that they don't even have to target power plants. All they got to do is target the core routers that tie our internet connections together and take down entire parts of the U.S. by just simply hitting these core routers. And of course, because of this, we should focus on making a more secure and reliable and trusted internet rather than one that is set up on a system of exploiting vulnerabilities and that the NSA is actually making us weaker. But it's interesting to note that Snowden kind of backtracked on something that he was uh, saying in this, the transcript here. He's basically explaining exactly what CISPA is. It, CISPA is the government saying, play ball with us, or the NSA saying, play ball, and we will give you legal immunity. He says, cyber intelligence sharing between private companies and government agencies is basically granting total immunity to private companies if they share all the information on their customers, immunizing companies in a way that allows them to invite groups like the NSA or the FBI if they voluntarily you know, put these surveillance devices on their internal networks. They're gonna immunize these companies for giving your information to the government willingly. But then Snowden sort of backs it up and says, oh, you know, I think that's a little bit too complicated for the American people to understand. So I don't understand where Snowden's going with this. He's basically saying that the NSA is bad, but then he's saying that we need tighter restrictions here, tighter regulations, um, basically saying we need a government that's not a gang style form of governance. Well, coming up, award-winning filmmaker Kevin Booth joins me in studio. We're gonna talk about the attack on the free press as well as the changing tide in the drug war. Every year we make resolutions to lose weight and get in shape. And the truth is it's hard, even with diet and exercise, because of toxic food in our environment that is stressing our bodies more than ever before. Working with experts in nutrition and biochemistry, I found that super high quality nutraceuticals, in addition to my diet and exercise, were the answers that synergistically worked. I could see the drastic changes every day with the amount of weight I've lost, my increased stamina, and more of a twinkle in my eye. 
That's why we are now so excited to launch the InfoWars Life Resolution Pack, combining three essential formulations, oxygen-based cleanser Oxy Powder, the Secret 12 Bioavailable Vitamin B12, and your choice of super female or super male vitality. Now all available at a discounted price to you and your family to bring in the new year and make 2015 a true success. That's InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. 2015 is the year to do it, and it all starts at InfoWarsLife.com. City of Austin tap water versus filtered City of Austin tap water. I can like taste dirt in it. God knows what's in this. This has an aftertaste. Tastes like Austin water? Yeah, it does. Ugh. These people just sampled City of Austin tap water straight from the faucet. Next, we had them try a sample of tap water filtered through the Pro Pure G2.0 filtration system. High quality H2O. That one is better. Tastes like nothing. Yep, I know what good water tastes like. It's good water. Most tap water contains added substances like fluoride, chlorine, Monsanto's deadly pesticide, glyphosate, and many others. Studies prove that these substances are linked to an assortment of major health issues, including tooth decay, lowered IQ, and even cancer. It tastes like you're drinking out of the lake when you're drinking tap water. Yeah, it has uh, that uh, processed flavor to it. The Pro Pure G2.0 filtration system removes these deadly substances and many more, leaving only fresh tasting, deliciously clean water. Okay, this is very tasty. It's good water. Refreshing. It's good. <laughs> Go to InfoWarsStore.com today. Use promo code WATER and save 10% off your Pro Pure purchase. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or call 1-888-253-3139. Joining me in studio today is award-winning filmmaker Kevin Booth. He's the director of American Drug War, American Drug War II, and other films. And, of course, he is constantly trying to shed some light on the upper echelons of government corruption, risking his life, and not to mention blowback from some of the world's most dangerous drug cartels. Uh, Kevin, thanks for joining us. Sure. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back in Austin yeah. in a while. So obviously it's always a dangerous time to be a journalist. Um, you know, recently, obviously, we had the massacre at the Charlie Hebdo magazine um, in retaliation for their characterization of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, but, what, but what we really covered here, we thought was even scarier, was the response by the mainstream media to self-censor. They would put up images of, of the police officer there who was begging for his life, yet they wouldn't put up a cartoon. What do you think about the attack on the free press and you know, giving I in? don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to think. I, you know, I think if part of us believe this is all like a staged event, you know, from the the Alex Jones school of thought here in the Alex studio. I mean, I almost it almost feels like this little chapter has to do with kind of getting the liberals on board a little bit. You know, I, I, it's really interesting to suddenly see. Um, Bill Maher come on Jimmy Kimmel two nights ago and, and was just dead serious. And suddenly there's like this new kind of like a uh, vibe in the air with, with Jon Stewart and, and these, you know, and I love all those guys. I love Bill Maher. I love Jon Stewart. I love those guys. But it seems like now they're on board the war on terror and a whole new level that they weren't before. So, exactly. you know, it's, it's like a, it's like reaching a new level. Yeah. And, and people actively calling for even more militarization of the police um, which there was actually a third hostage situation in, in Paris today. We don't really know if it had anything to do with the specifics of the Charlie Heb Hebdo attack, but it just kind of goes to show that when you have, you know, 1,500 heavily militarized police in your city looking for people, they're still able to take hostages in another part of, of the city because there's no, they don't have guns to protect themselves, even the police officers don't. So calling for this over-militarization of the police doesn't even really make sense especially when they're here policing us, you and I. Um, but do you agree with some of these mainstream outlets that, you know, they shouldn't show certain images because they offend? No, no. I think, it's just, I think we should be allowed to look at anything we want. And, and anytime they do that, it just, you know, 
they're just making you want it more, like like this deal that just happened with that movie, The Interview. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole time I was watching this whole Sony scandal, I'm thinking either these people are idiots or this is the most brilliant like PR strategy campaign I've ever seen in my life because it's a crappy movie, but now everybody's going to go see it, including me. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you can't, it, it never works. Like whenever you try to censor it, you're just going to make people want to see it. And, and yet they know that anyways. And so, yeah, it's just self-perpetuating. Yeah, and then now with the internet, it's always kind of coming back around that they sort of had their hand in it the entire time, and they're thinking, oh, well, if we, we just, re our sales were through the roof when we released it online, way more than they would have been. Uh, so now they're thinking that this could be something they, they could do in the future for other films, but are we going to have more fake cyber attacks to... <laughs> what was the last one? I remember The Last Temptation of Christ, so that was, that was one. I mean, every, every time one of these happens, it just, you know, it's a way of just making everybody pay attention you yeah. know and so absolutely it's uh you know i don't know i i think uh censorship you, you you either have freedom of speech or you don't you know there's no there's no line you can't draw a line in there right you well it, you've been really fearless with a lot of your films and uh we actually got a story up on on infowars.com today about uh, the drug cartels putting a 45 million dollar bounty on Rick Perry's head as well as uh, Sheriff Arpaio, Sheriff Arpaio. who was you who know, I spent time with yeah. as well and yeah. do you ever fear for your life in that respect you know I mean I, I did censor one scene out of the last film I made and, and we were in this uh, neighborhood in Juarez where I was shooting all this like really poor people and there was all these little rubble houses and people living in boxes and in the middle of all this was like this pimped out mansion painted purple and it's gee I wonder where the cartel guy lives right and I was gonna put it in there but then I realized on Google Maps with looking at it that you could actually you know because I was saying where we were in the movie that I could actually go on Google Map and figure out like where this cartel leaders house was for my movie and, and everybody you know all the producers and, and everybody else involved and in I was like let's do it and everybody else in the movie the <laughs> investors and everybody so I got um, um, I chickened out on that one, I'll admit, you know, someday I'll, maybe I'll put out that image on my deathbed <laughs> or something, about, it, it won't matter anymore. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I think, uh, it, you know, you gotta put yourself out there a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously I, I'm not brave or anything like that, I don't wanna get hurt, I don't want anything bad to happen to me or my family, just, you know, just it, it tell stories. I think a lot of times when these things happen, it's very random. Uh, and. As far as Sheriff Arpaio, I don't know that much about Rick Perry, you know, but I know a lot more about Arpaio because I've been crossing lines with him for a while. And, and uh, it, it seems like, I mean, I remember when, when I went to go with him, he had like a uh, like a bomb-proof car and he had he's always had threats against his life and all that. And, and half of the time, I think he's making those things up himself just to make himself famous um, in Phoenix, you know? And when you go to Phoenix, or back then when I was filming on this is, you know, years ago, you know, you, you you talk to anybody and it's just like, oh yeah, we like Sheriff Arpaio. Yeah, don't say anything bad about Sheriff Arpaio. You know, so it's like the whole city is afraid of their sheriff. It's just a very bizarre thing. People living in tent city that are like wanting his autograph, you know? It's yeah. like, oh, let, let's get the autograph of the man who's like forcing me to live out in a 130 degree tent. <laughs> um, it's just a, it's very weird. So, you know, as far as these cartels go, yeah, it's just it's just all these it's it's just hard to tell. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. is there really some centralized thing where this is all happening, or is it just like you know, one guy makes this threat? Is there you know, if I kill Rick Perry, do, am I really going to get forty five million dollars? You know, where do right. I how do I collect that? Yeah, like that's you know? actually they're going to call. Is up that going to be over PayPal? They're probably or like, just going to kill you. Yeah, am I going to get my <laughs> PayPal account um, to uh, <laughs> exactly. collect my reward? I, you know, so I don't know how much of that is real, how much of it is all talk. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the drug cartels, I know just obviously being in the industry, it is frightening at times. A lot of people won't cover the activity as of the drug cartels because they'll chop off your head or you know shoot up the news station like they like they do there on the border in the border cities. But now, obviously, we have radical Islam kind of coming out and doing this as well. So we're we're seeing that they have these groups that are are beginning to react. You know, when you poke the bear, now the bear is kind of. Yeah. showing its teeth it is kind of a scary thing it's just kind of i guess with the with the is there something more honest i think about cartels than than the whole terrorist thing and that it's just all about money you know i can't explain it i know it's a bad it's not a, not a good thing to say 
but it's something more honest about just handing someone money and saying go kill someone than it for being for some uh, religious ideology that doesn't make any sense. It's mm. just completely crazy. Uh, when I was in Juarez, I was interviewing young boys who would commit murder for $40 a pop. You know, and it, it just makes you realize like, you know, humanity, but then you get to this place and you realize, you know, these people don't even know how they're gonna eat, you know, tomorrow. And, and so you're, you're, you know, you got people with all this money next to people that are completely poor. And, and I think th those kind of conditions are always gonna craze. I think, I think a lot of it is just poverty and ignorance, you know, and mixed in with people trying to make a lot of money and control people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, I think they just kind of spend things to their own advantage when they can. Yeah. So what do you think this, the fake drug war could have, what effect could that have if we, you know, if, I mean, obviously your documentaries have done a lot to shine some light on the truth there, but do you think that could have any effect on, on, you know, these kids and... You know, I don't know. I mean, right now it's it's interesting. I, uh, I go to Colorado, you know, I, I, California was the leading edge of the whole marijuana thing for a while, but now Colorado is obviously taking the sword. And, and now it's interesting that uh, um, neighboring states uh, like Oklahoma are, I guess, suing Colorado because of all the marijuana coming over the border. As, and then they're trying to use that as a reason of why it's not working. And I think anybody with half a brain would look at that and go, well, that's a reason why you should legalize it in Oklahoma. I mean, it just goes to show that people in Oklahoma, if people in Oklahoma are having to go to Colorado to buy marijuana, right? Uh, uh, what am I missing here? Yeah, it's you know, not what just exactly this, am I missing here? Yeah, it's not Of course, just then you go to Oklahoma and it's like Oral Roberts and all that. So I don't know. They got the 900 <laughs> foot Jesus there. I, you know, I don't know what to think. <laughs> Well, okay, so in American Drug War, the first American Drug War, you set out to discover basically why the drug war is such a big failure. American Drug War II, the second film, follows cutting edge of cannabis research, um, obviously a few years in between those films, so we're starting to see a shift. Where do we see this going? Well, it's interesting that we've gone all the way from marijuana is bad for you, can cause cancer to a gateway drug, all the way to marijuana can actually not only help with cancer, but actually cure cancer in some forms, you know? I mean, how much further do you have to go? You know, meanwhile, every day the FDA is approving another like hellish drug and saying that's okay, uh, even though it has all these incredible, horrible side effects, and yet, and eighty percent of the population wants marijuana legalized, and yet they're going to just keep clinging on to this. I think I think the drug war and what's happening with legalized legalization of marijuana and the whole movement right now is just so in your face of how corporate corporate interests are outweighing the voters' desires, mm -hmm. and and it's just getting more and more blatant mm -hmm. as time goes. Because with the internet and social media, you know the the secret is out of the bag, the genie's out of the bottle that marijuana should have never been illegal in the first place. And right. it wasn't in the first place. It's um, a plant. Yeah, it's a plant, you know, <laughs> to, you know, and, and it's, uh, it just, it just sucks. It's, you know, I mean, it should be growing everywhere. It, it just, it just, you come to Texas and you see all these people that could really use it and need it. And they, you know, it's like, why isn't it just growing everywhere? And meanwhile, yeah, well, because everything the, the is just, drug cartel, big pharma doesn't yeah. want that to happen. Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> people are dying from uh, Tylenol. Right. You know, and exactly. cough syrup and, and uh, people's not to lives are these, destroy, yeah. destroyed from being addicted to these pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. And not to mention, I mean, because when you get into this, like, you know, people go down the rabbit hole of taking uh, taking uh, pain pills. And then and then once you start taking pain pills for so many years, you end up having to take antidepressants. And then you have to start have to take pills that are like to counterbalance the problems created by the antidepressants. Yeah. And that's just like, oh, it's just okay. And the doctors yeah, take will just keep that, leading you down that, that thing. And then they're commingling with each other. And, and you mentioned your, your, your blood pressure is going off the wall and you're having suicidal thoughts. But you mentioned to your doctor, like, what about cannabis? Like, uh, exactly. You know? and, it, and it's just, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. There's certain things that maybe shouldn't have been for profit. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not... I believe in capitalism, uh, but something about the medical profession being so for profit and mm -hmm. how much profit there is in the pharmaceutical industry and all that, you know, I, I don't know. It feels like the whole medical profession just went off track somewhere. Absolutely. You know? Being able I to mean, hold these cures from people, yeah, letting talk, people die. And, you know, and, and going into Obamacare and, and just all the, the hellishness of getting into Obamacare and even myself, like on Obamacare now and, and uh, 
having some little medical problem and, and like these crummy doctors they send me to and I have to go to like some bad neighborhood to some, have to some <laughs> Russian doctor who doesn't speak English using some 1960s equipment on me and you know, it's just like, <laughs> damn, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Affordable care. Can I just have some pot? For everybody. Can I just have some pot, please? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can I just, I'll just grow it myself. So, what do you think about the states that have legalized it being able to push back against federal intrusion? We're still seeing that the war is still on there. Um, in D.C., the voters voted for it and they're saying, no, you can't have that. We're going to go ahead and push back. Well, first of all, if you've ever been to D.C., uh, I, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want everybody to be high on pot. It's a really <laughs> scary, weird, I mean, I it's the most segregated, dangerous <laughs> place in the world. And wherever there's a dangerous ghetto, trust me, it's better if they're all smoking pot. You want everybody <laughs> to be high, trust me. Yeah. If you want safer streets, pot, please. Yeah. But see, I don't think that that would work because then they couldn't keep everyone in this constant state of fear of yeah. like terrorism, because I don't think anyone's really worried about terrorists when they're, you know, high and laughing at. And, <laughs> and I've never seen anybody that's been stoned, really heavily stoned, wanting to buy crack, you know? Yeah. I, I, you know, but I have seen plenty of people who are drunk wanting to get cocaine or speed. So the, the whole gateway theory. Or thinking um, that they can drive yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> forget about it, yeah. I mean, the, the, the whole gateway theory is so ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it's putting, Putting marijuana in the same classification as other harsh drugs, and then and then pharmaceuticals aren't, it, yeah. you know, and and uh, and you know we we became foster parents too back in in Los Angeles, and and all these foster kids are also on all this medication. I mean, mm -hmm. they they Mandatory. purposely yeah they purposely drug all these foster kids up, and and what becomes even trickier is when, you know, you the, the kids like that they don't even want to get off it because they, they become addicted, you know? And yet they're convinced that they're not addicted to drugs because like- They're a, legal. You, because it's from a doctor. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And even I'll be like, watch my little documentaries. It's like, no, it's like, <laughs> you know, the drug addiction is a lot stronger than reasoning. You know, drug addiction is a very powerful animal that overpowers everything. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of lives destroyed from that, just coming from Florida where it's a huge epidemic there. Um, which is a lot of the time where we want to educate our viewers on jury nullification mm -hmm. so that when they do have those opportunities to, to get in those courtrooms where they are looking at weed cases or whatever, they can decide if it's a, a just law right. to send someone to prison because they had a joint. Right. Not to mention, I mean, I think one of the, this whole thing is not even close to being over until we can start letting people out of prison. There's so many people that are still in prison for like little small, ridiculous, you know, marijuana related cases mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I think, I think there's a big part of the government now that's wanting to make everybody think like, oh, the pot, the pot thing is, a, you know, you, you guys don't need to be protesting about pot anymore. Just look, you know, go to Colorado. It's all good, you know? Yeah. And, and of course, a lot of people now are using Colorado as like, look at it's turning into like, you know, pot hell because look at all the people are, but you know then just I don't know I mean I'm sure it'll just it's, open it's, up the, the gates excitement of yeah. it, it'll I think it'll fizzle out a little bit but yeah I, if you let it spread out it won't be such a you know a hotbed for it if it's you know hey when they legalize it here in Texas I'll be the first guy to try to open a dispensary on 6th street yeah well, That'll be sweet. I won't admit That'll be a that sweet I day. might be lined up there. All right, so, all right. <laughs> well, we just had a freeway, uh, Ricky Ross in studio, oh, yeah? basically talking about the the pipeline to prison and how the the hip hop industry and is really trying to set up a whole generation of people to to go and li spend their lives in prison to idolize this kind of gang culture, drug culture, and things like that, and. Um, you know, what was your experience working? You mean if I don't put go into debt to put corporate logos all over my body, <laughs> I'm not cool? Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, gee, uh, <laughs> oh, I, lo I love Rick. You know, I've, I've been friends with Ricky now, um, God, over 10 years. You know, I helped him, I helped with his case a little bit, helped him get out of prison, and um, Priya Rick is awesome. Um, and so we've got, there's a new film coming out that I didn't make this film, but I was a co-producer on it. I've, I've helped with a little bit called Crack in the System and it premieres on Al Jazeera in February. So check that out, Crack in the System, the Freeway Ricky Ross story. Uh, it was an amazing, amazing job done by Mark Levin and others. Yeah, and he, I mean, were you shocked to 
um, discovering anything with the CIA's connections with that. I mean, even when we spoke to him, he was like, well, I didn't know, you know, I just. <laughs> right, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's funny because I, you know, I'm always like the guy, maybe because I'm a Libra who gets caught in the middle of people. Like I got caught in between Alex Jones and Peter Joseph of Zeitgeist. And I got caught in between Alex Jones and uh, Mike Rupert, you know. And Mike Rupert was like the LAPD guy that said that 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 uh, said the, the CIA was trying to pay him to do that. And and uh, you know, and Gary Webb died, and then Mike Rupert just committed suicide. So it's like you you see these these whistleblowers committing suicide one after another. And you know, there's part of you that says like, oh, it's gotta be the CIA killing him. And then there's another part of you, it's like, well, I knew that guy, he was a little like off and depressed and maybe drank too much and all that. And, and then sometimes I wonder if there's like a fine line on there where people just allow these things to get to them. I think maybe that's why Alex, Alex just seems to be kind of like this bullish character who just can just keep going, whether you love him or hate him. He just has this, uh, you know, this ability to kind of like roll it off at the end of the night and enjoy life, you know. So, you know, if I could say that's all the, all the Alex Jones viewers out there, don't take anything too seriously. If you get, if yeah. if you allow yourself to get too bummed out or too freaked out by any of this, then then they're winning. They, yeah, they've you know, won. And they've won. So, you know, no matter how scary or messed up the world seems, like you know. It's all just a ride, Yeah, Bill used to say. Yeah, absolutely. That's what Alex told me when I first started working here, was just go, dan go dance, go have fun, go yeah. out to dinner with your friends. That's yeah. how you win. Yeah, That's don't stay up them. all night like reading conspiracy books mm -hmm. and like, think, you know, just, you gotta, you gotta just. That's what they want yeah, is to you keep your mind trapped yeah, exactly. in that fear. And to make people like us seem crazy. It, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, so I know you were here speaking with Alex on the radio show today, and uh, is there anything you can tell me about your top secret top secret? projects? I don't know. <laughs> it's not that top secret. Well, I've got a, a couple of documentaries underway. One is, like, really serious, and the other one's more comical. The serious one is uh, it's going to be a look at how um, governments have been staged in elections and, and it have been rigged throughout history to create the history of the world. It's, but what, and I know that's been a, it's a story that Alex Jones has told many times before, but the difference between this one is that we're gonna be going over to a former Soviet uh, country and telling a lot of the, the film from there. Hmm. And so I'd like to give a shout out to uh, everybody in Sofia, Bulgaria, who's watching this interview. That will be coming over there soon. And so we've got, we've got a, a very rare, amazing thing to have like a, a stronghold, a base of operations with, SWAT style security, the whole bit, to be able to go to some former Soviet places and, and do some journalism that would have never been possible before. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one film. The other film is gonna be another pot doc because I just can't stay off of it. I don't know, I just can't. It's just too fun and easy to make pot docs when yeah, you're surrounded well, by it. People love it. You know, <laughs> as long as they're buying, I'm selling. Um, but uh, it, this one is gonna be a look at all these publicly traded companies that are out there right now. There's over 130 publicly traded marijuana companies and a lot of them are all fraudulent. And it's become, it's become a way for, like it's a, it's, I'm looking at it as almost a new shift in the drug war and, and you've got people out there that are making millions of dollars off of drugs that are never even touching drugs. Right. And it's actually drug dealing has moved on to the stock market yet now. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and a lot of it's penny stocks. Yeah. You know, and we're talking to people like Jordan Belford, who was actually cellmates with Tommy Chong when I visited Tommy in prison for the first drug war film. Uh, Tommy was writing his book in prison at the time called Teo of Chong. And he had this uh, Wall Street uh, guy in, in prison with him. And he convinced this guy, hey, you should write a book. Well, it turned out to be The Wolf of Wall Street. Wow. So how crazy is that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, I was gonna say those yeah. guys are probably used to yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing on there. Yeah, so Jordan <laughs> Belford and um, um, and so there's just, the, there's a whole a whole nother layer right now going on in the marijuana industry that I don't think a lot of people are aware of that I think is absolutely fascinating and some uh, Ponzi schemes that are in, in just crazy money making schemes of people pulling millions of dollars out of thin air mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of people will just think like, hey, I'll invest in marijuana. It sounds like a good investment. Well, if they're not realizing, you know, they, they better look at who they're really investing in. Right. Well, because it's, there's all sorts of things that they can just kind of put out there and then, oh, no, we've decided we're not going to legalize it in this yeah. state. Or, I mean, 
But now we got the PayPal founder just coming out becoming yeah, one of marijuana's biggest investors. So we're seeing that, you know, the cat's kind of out of the bag on cannabis here. It's just which way is it going to go? I personally think, uh, you know, Monsanto and companies like this are trying to figure out how they can, um, you know, turn it into a genetically modified well, thing there's to been, control. There's but. been a lot of, there's been conspiracies the whole, like ever since I've been in the pot movement about how companies are trying to uh, put genetics into the marijuana thing. When you get into these high-end marijuana people, they're all about their genetics and owning like proprietary genetics and all this. And, and yeah, it's a, a very interesting thing. Yeah, all these strains <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and like being able to trademark or copyright or patent these strains. And, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see if that's ever really able to be fought out in court or not, you know, so it, it's, it's interesting. Well, they can do it with corn and yeah. tomatoes. Yeah, I know. So I'm sure that I'm sure they will in the future. So it's, it's going to be a, a, it'll be a crazy future, you know, <laughs> as this thing is, cause there's a lot of money in it. But at the same time, there's something different about the pot business than even the alcohol business. And so a lot of people always draw the similarities between the ending of alcohol prohibition to where we are right now with alcohol. I mean, where we are with marijuana right now. And yeah, there are similarities to that, but then at the other, at the other end, people weren't able to grow great alcohol in their backyard. Um, you know, and so marijuana is a, it's a different animal. It, it really lends itself to the do it yourselfers and the people who are not gonna like sign up to be a part of some big thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, marijuana almost breeds a very, uh, you know, very loner individualistic kind of thing, in, you know, in, in, on some regards compared to alcohol. Yeah, it already has been kind of thriving in the underground yeah. for all of, all of this time, so. Right, I mean, when alcohol prohibition ended, people were like, okay, I wanna get Bacardi rum, or I wanna get, you know, when, when, when marijuana prohibition ends, people, they just, they're, they're gonna get whatever they can, wherever they can, and do it however they can, and they're gonna try to spend as little money as possible, and there's just no way they can control it. That's what's so amazing about pot. They just can't control it. They can't stop it. It's like a, it's like a little weed that beat the government, you know? Yeah. And that's what's great, because <laughs> the more the government tried to, like, beat down this weed, actually, the, the stronger it got, you know? I mean, we didn't, yeah, I mean, they, they complain about how the, how there's so much more THC today. It's like, well, Thanks to you guys, you yeah. know what I mean. <laughs> That's right, you guys. You guys, Stronger because of what you guys, yeah, because of what you did. Like the the pot is better than ever because like people are out there perfecting that stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've I've heard some of the best vegetables uh, you're ever gonna find are inside of prisons because you, where there's marijuana growers that are in prison because these guys are in there like making tomatoes and onions that are like these little perfect, you know. Things and so Tommy Chong <laughs> was telling me the best vegetables of all time were <laughs> like grown with all these. Want to make like, sure their scientific expertise yeah. doesn't so you know, it's, lose that. <laughs> yeah, it's like this whole this whole breed out there of people that are uh, you know, and, and so it's interesting to see this PayPal guy, uh, this Peter Thiel, who I guess he's the one that they uh, they based that Silicon Valley show mm -hmm. on that HBO show, the, the Mike Judd show was based on him, and um, so that's fascinating though that that he's getting into this for sure. Yeah, I think a lot of investors are, and people obviously watching the stock market are, like you said, trying to figure out how they can get in on this and maybe not in the penny stocks because we saw that in exactly the Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. It's funny how it all comes around, but that's how people are kind of losing out in this. Um, well, anything else you didn't get to talk about on the Alex Jones show today? God, <laughs> you know, I don't, um, no, I feel pretty, yeah, yeah. no, I, it was great coming to Austin and being here. And yeah, well, we're glad appreciate to it. Yeah. be a part of your upcoming top secret project. Yeah, and yeah. We're looking forward to Alex it. Alex already did a great interview for it, so, you know, I'm sure it's going to be a year or so before this thing comes out. There's a lot of work to do, but. Yeah. Appreciate you guys having us here, and you guys have been great. Well, we appreciate you and everything you've done. Documentary is obviously one of the best ways to break open minds. All right. Shatter Thanks through so much. the lies and illusion. All right. <laughs> Thank All you. All right. Thank you. And that's it for the show tonight. If you are watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Become a subscriber to the Alex Jones channel. We will bring you constant updates, flooding your feed with all that you need to fight the info war. And then head over to prisonplanet.tv. We are still running our special, only $29.95 a year. And you can share your username and password with up to 20 people at the same time. So that is an excellent deal. Get yours today. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And we'll see you here again Monday night at 7 p.m. Central.
city of Austin tap water versus filtered city of Austin tap water. I can like taste dirt in it. God knows what's in this. This has an aftertaste. Tastes like Austin water? Yeah, it does. Ugh. These people just sampled city of Austin tap water straight from the faucet. Next, we had them try a sample of tap water filtered through the Pro Pure G2.0 filtration system. High quality H2O. That one is better. Tastes like nothing. Yep, I know what good water tastes like. It's good water. Most tap water contains added substances like fluoride, chlorine, Monsanto's deadly pesticide, glyphosate, and many others. Studies prove that these substances are linked to an assortment of major health issues, including tooth decay, lowered IQ, and even cancer. It tastes like you're drinking out of the lake when you're drinking tap water. It has uh, that uh, processed flavor to it. The Pro Pure G2.0 filtration system removes these deadly substances and many more, leaving only fresh tasting, deliciously clean water. Okay, this is very tasty. It's good water. Refreshing. It's good. <laughs> Go to InfoWarsStore.com today. Use promo code WATER and save 10% off your Pro Pure purchase. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or call 1-888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.